Storytelling is a powerful tool. It gives us the ability to reach out and connect through words, but you don't have to be a writer or even love writing to become a good storyteller. Think of someone you know who can tell a dinner table story like no one else. He or she is probably animated, voice vibrant. You're hanging on to every word. What is it about those words? Now think of the last good book you read. What was it about that author's words that pulled you in and made you want to read more? Think about your own writing, your articles, your blogs, your client alerts. Maybe you haven't written any recently and that's okay, but you still have a style. Keep these things in the back of your mind as we talk about storytelling for lawyers and how to find your voice. There is an art to telling a good story, but before we can talk about how, let's talk about why. So let's talk science. Why use stories? Well, it turns out researchers have found that most decision making, including in business, is driven by our emotions. We like to think that we're logical, but in fact, we use data and facts to post rationalize the decisions our emotions have already driven us to make. Like that new car. You bought it for the great gas mileage, right? Because it was the most economical option? Or did you buy it because of how it made you feel? The feeling you got sitting behind the wheel, the feeling maybe from the name brand, and then you decided that the gas mileage was good and the purchase fit your budget. Automakers certainly use stories to sell cars, and they're not alone. How many of you watch the Super Bowl for the ads, right? We've all heard about this concept, watching for the ads, or even Super Bowl ad watching parties. The most expensive night in all of TV advertising. Companies pay millions of dollars for just 30 to 60 seconds to persuade you to buy their products. One company has a rich tradition of continuing a particular storyline throughout its ads over the years. In fact, Nightline did a story on the story. Let's watch. So this Sunday, Anheuser-Busch will spend approximately $20 million on their Super Bowl ads. And as is tradition, one of them is going to feature the Clydesdales, the horses that have been tied to Budweiser for generations. But the iconic mascots, they don't come cheap. The horses are actually born and bred in-house as part of a multi-million dollar operation. As ABC's Darren Ravel got an exclusive look inside. You wouldn't know it by looking at this Clydesdale foal. But just a few weeks into her life, she's about to be thrust into the spotlight. Meet the star of this year's iconic Budweiser Clydesdale Super Bowl commercial, which will be watched by more than 100 million people in the U.S. alone this Sunday. For 80 years now, Clydesdale horses have been much more than just a branded mascot for Budweiser. They've been part of the family. Hi, Mama. Jeff Knapper runs the company's multi-million dollar operation that breeds, feeds, and trains these mammoth horses from the time they're born to the time they've pulled their final wagon. It's more than just a job for him. The horses are his life. Come over and say hi. The company is committed to the Clydesdales, because they represent the tradition and the heritage and the quality that goes into everything we do. And for the company to get it done and get it done the right way, it's got to be in-house. And this is a big operation for us. It's a significant investment. Jeff's team takes care of the daily needs of 175 Clydesdales around the country. There's a future Clydesdale right, right, in, right in here, huh? A future Clydesdale right in here. And I'm, I'm thinking that this, uh, this girl's ready to... Uh, Get the little fella on the ground. Oh, we're, we're, we're close on her? Yeah, we're close. An operation that includes breeding 43 horses a year. Budweiser hopes to gain 10 future show Clydesdales from that group. Only males are eligible, which leaves just enough room for error. We have very, very stringent requirements to be a Budweiser Clydesdale. They have to have a white blaze, a black mane and tail, this dark bay in color, and four white stocking feet. Those that don't make the cut are sold for roughly $5,000 a piece, while some of the female horses, like eight-year-old Darla, mother to our Super Bowl star, are kept to keep the future alive. 
This year's Super Bowl spot tells the story of a young Clydesdale who establishes a relationship with his breeder. Like real life Clydesdales, the horse leaves in order to learn the skills that will one day make him one of the special few to pull the hitch in front of crowds of people. The breeder goes to see his favorite horse in a parade. And sure enough, the horse remembers him. The script doesn't mirror an exact story, but it's not far off. So now we're entering our polling area. Okay. This is where the baby's actually, the mother's actually give birth. John um, Soto manages Warm Springs Ranch in Bloomville, Bloomville Missouri. This is a little girl where future Clydesdales are born. And she's uh, five days old right now. And where they stay until they're as old as two. Even though we don't see them after they're two, they were born here. And so, of course, when you go out on the road and or if you see the hitch and those are your babies that we raised, you know, you got to have some pride in that. All the foals born this year will be under Soto's watch, literally. Over the next couple months, it's Soto's job to make sure every baby Clydesdale arrives healthy. With 40 coming through the next few months, um, you know, we're going to be pretty hectic. That's why he has a warning system that tells him when a mare is ready to give birth. Tell me how your whole alarm system works. So what we have is this little alarm that attaches to the back of the mare. So if I'm eating dinner or asleep in the house, of course starts coming out. Right, pulls this magnet out, the alarm goes off, then, and I get, there it is right there. Have you ever forgot to charge your phone? No, not this time of year. <laughs> That's my lifeline. <laughs> John lives on the farm to ensure he is right there when he needs to be. He can even monitor the horse stalls from his bedroom. Yeah, yeah I see it. That's funny. Now, in the Super Bowl commercial, it has the person playing you, your story, sleeping in a, in a bar. Do you do that? I did it for many years, but now since we've came here, all the stalls are monitored, so it gives me the luxury of actually sleeping in my own bed. But Soto, who has done this for 33 years, does develop a relationship with every Clydesdale born here. They're just like people. Once you get to know them and know their, their size and their facial looks and everything, you know who they are. Every year, the top 30 mature Clydesdales for the country. In 2012, three hitches appeared at 120 events representing the Bud brand. John's son, Eric, drives one of those hitches. This is where they do most of their training. Jeff Knapper took us to check in on some of the up-and-coming Clydesdales. This is Elite. He's one of uh, the horses here in training and um, where we teach them all kinds of different things today. You know, we're they're grooming on Elite and uh, giving him a haircut and getting him ready. He's actually getting ready to go out to be part of the uh, St. Louis traveling team. The Clydesdale connection to the brand traces back to 1933 when August Bush Jr. surprised his father by having these majestic horses parade down a St. Louis street carrying beer to celebrate the end of Prohibition. They've been breeding them since 1940. They're a symbol of Budweiser. They're a symbol of the, of the company and, and to many people, a symbol of the country. That the freedom and spirit that is America is embodied in these majestic Clydesdales. In our time with the Clydesdales, we couldn't help but notice how incredibly close you can get to these horses, excuse me, or how close these horses will get to you. <laughs> Standing next to one of these gentle giants, whether you're a little kid or you're 80 years old, the emotion and seeing these animals, it's, it's awesome. Awesome to think that so much goes into making this horse the face, make that the legs of the brand. For Nightline, Darren Ravel in Boonville, Missouri. So how does this work? How do stories capture our attention? It turns out storytelling actually evokes a neurological response. Good stories, stories that connect to us, actually release oxytocin in our brains. That's the feel-good chemical that promotes connection and empathy. Scientists have found that the higher our levels of oxytocin, the more empathy we have and the more likely we are to act on that emotion. Advertisers have been using this persuasive power of storytelling for years, as we just saw. Okay, but not every story we tell will evoke a feel-good response. An urgent alert, a boring yet important update. We run the full spectrum, right? Well, we can still evoke emotion. Remember, emotions also run the full spectrum. Happy, sad, confused, astonished, anxious. Storytelling structure 
also creates an emotional response. People are attracted to stories, one researcher says, because we're social creatures and we relate to other people. Recognized as a leading trial lawyer of his time, you've probably heard of this man, attorney Mo Levine, often used the whole man theory to successfully influence juries in order to empathize with his clients. A refresher? Seeking compensation for a client who had lost both arms in an accident, Levine pointed, um, painted a brief yet emotional picture to one jury. I'll quote him here. As you know, he said, about an hour ago, we broke for lunch. I saw the bailiff come and take you all as a group to have lunch in the jury room. Then I saw the defense attorney. He and his client decided to go to lunch together. The judge and court clerk also went to lunch. So I turned to my client, Harold, and said, why don't you and I go to lunch together? We went across the street to that little restaurant and had lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, I just had lunch with my client. He has no arms. He has to eat like a dog. Thank you very much. Levine reportedly won one of the largest settlements in the history of the state of New York. So what makes a story good? Like Levine, a compelling character, a memorable message, emotion. And that emotion, again, can take all forms, urgency, inspiration, motivation, all emotions that we can evoke to connect to our audience. That is, in fact, the entire purpose of storytelling, to make that connection. So let's relate all of this back to our legal writing. We have established that stories sell. Like it or not, and sometimes we don't like it, but we are all salesmen. We want to sell legal services. Put the two together, Stories sell legal services. Stories make ideas stick. They persuade us, they motivate us, they demonstrate to us. You've heard, don't tell me, show me. Well, that's exactly what stories do. Stories show us. It's why preachers tell so many stories on Sunday when they're giving their sermons. Politicians, well, we won't talk about politicians in an election year other than to say they use stories too. Unfortunately, in the era of PowerPoint and status updates, we sometimes forget how to tell a good story. We get caught up in our word limits or our legalese, and stories can often get lost or buried. So let's look at some examples from law firms. I've handed out, or you will find in an attachment, um, some examples here. At its surface level, a story about property tax exemptions may not be the most exciting story that someone's going to click on and, and read more about, but take a look at this first line here. It reads, a local veteran who served in the Navy more than 60 years ago, dot, 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 dot. A local veteran more than 60 years ago. Right away, this story is pulling on your heartstrings. Whether this tax property tax exemption impacts you or not, you likely want to read more because it's appealing to your emotions. Okay, the next story here. Again, at its surface, a story on Medicare probably isn't going to be the most exciting read. I think even attorney, the attorney who wrote it might agree with that. But here we have in our very first line, proposed rules would mean that those living with chronic conditions like diabetes and Alzheimer's would have access to more preventative care. Again, right away, pulling people in. Why do they care? Chances are with two such um, high profile and common diseases, that maybe they know someone who's been impacted and they're gonna read a little bit further to read about Medicare and what those proposed rules are. Our next example, YouTube clip Clip, YouTube clip controversy ends up in court. First line, when you post your opinion on YouTube, are you protected by the First Amendment? Again, grabbing people's attention, connecting with them. Finally, this last one I have attached here is from another firm that does a really great job, such a great job with storytelling, in fact, that they have a full-time copy editor on their staff, on their marketing staff. Um, and here you have top 10 points of guidance for employers on the Zika virus outbreak. Again, in the very first line, it tells you um, this is a public health emergency of international concern. 
Next line, the workplace is not immune from Zika concerns. In fact, in many cases, the workplace will likely be at the forefront of both preventing the spread of and leading the response to the disease. Again, playing on your emotions, capturing your attention, letting you know why you care and why this is so important. You know, the same firm does such a great job of storytelling. I mentioned they have a full-time copy editor on staff. They also like to think outside of the box and get creative. Sometimes our, our storytelling isn't just in the words we write in our, in our press releases, our blogs, our articles. Sometimes it's in how we, I don't know, perhaps invite clients to an event. Let's take a look at something they've done. <clears throat> For attention, please. Now stepping up to the plate, in-house attorneys attending the Association of Corporate Counsel's annual meeting. Those Cracker Jack attorneys at Wongle Carlisle would like to invite you to get an after-hours get-together at the Bleacher Box, located under the bleachers of Boston Historics in May Park. The festivities take place from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. on Monday, October 19th. Wombo Carlisle will even provide a continuous shuttle from the Heinz Convention Center to the Bleach of Honor. Wombo Carlisle sponsors the ACC Compliance and Ethics Committee, and we would love to see you all in person. So telegram, telephone, or tell a friend, but be there on October 19th. As you can see here, a very interesting take on a client invite, of course, using the baseball theme because this particular event was at Fenway Park. Okay, we're going to shift gears and we're also going to talk about um, kind of your words and how they're used even behind the scenes to promote our content. Jenny's going to speak to us on search engine optimization. So at this point, you guys have put in all the work. You've crafted a wonderful story. You're ready for it to be uploaded. But the true intention of you writing this article or blog is you want people to reach out to you, right? It's not just for your health. You're not just writing to write. You want people to take action on it. So we, in turn, want people to find it. We want lots of people to find it. So one thing that we do when we get your guys' information, when we upload it to our website, we also upload it to our blog site, which is a WordPress site. And WordPress is a, is a CMS that um, really enables blogs to be seen throughout the internet easily. Um, and a tool that it comes with is an SEO toolkit, so search engine um, optimization. Um, and in that toolkit, um, we will then load the article into the WordPress site. It then asks for us um, an SEO title, an SEO description, and SEO keywords. So for example, I'll use, um, Ed did two great blog posts for us recently that got a ton of traffic. It was your brewery blog, blog post and how to start a winery blog post. So people were very interested in those topics. And so for the title, it's recommended that those are about 80 characters. The title will show if you were to Google um, starting a winery in Michigan, when the search, when the, when the results upload, that title is the clickable link at the top, right? So it's very important that that title is to the point and it is exactly what is within the content. You then get a description, which is about 160 characters, so about a tweet. And you wanna make sure that that really gives as best of a synopsis of the material as you possibly can. We then are able to put in keywords. And those keywords, I try and do a mixture of short keywords and long tail keywords. Short keywords for um, Ed would be winery, starting a winery. I mean, everything you could think of. I'll probably pump in about 60 <laughs> keywords based on the content that you provide. And then we'll do long tail keywords. And that would be more of a phrase. So if you guys remember Ask Jeeves, the search engine way back when, when you could put in an actual question, People still search that way very often. So I will then put exactly how they would phrase that question. How do I start a winery in Michigan? What laws do I need to follow starting a winery in Michigan? Like I will go ahead and pump all those in as well. So when you guys are giving us that content, long story short, if there is something that you think would, this goes hand in hand with some sort of search, or it would be really helpful for them to know that this goes with this particular practice area, this headline in the news, and something that I wouldn't necessarily pull out of the content provided, make sure to let us know because we'll want to definitely put that in there because it does really make a difference. Those, not only is your article crawled by search engines, but those keywords are definitely affecting how your article shows and what organic ranking your article shows us. So for example, with um, the ACA and healthcare reform, our healthcare practice at the time when that was a really hot topic, probably cranked out a blog post a week, 
maybe two at the most with lag time. And because of that effort that they put in with a weekly or every other week blog post, their pages are still ranking very high organically for a healthcare lawyer or a healthcare law search result within Michigan. Um, and that's really because of the longevity of those articles and people still are accessing those articles and finding them to date. So putting that work in and making sure that the SEO toolkit matched exactly what was there has really benefited them in the long run. Thanks, Jenny. Well, as I promised, you will not leave without getting at least 10 tips. In fact, I have passed out and will link to this video, a blog with 50, quick 50 writing tools. This is put out by the Pointer Institute, which is a leading um, institute uh, globally for, um, for journalists who are storytellers by nature. In addition, I wanna leave you with three main points. It all comes down to this, number one, why do I care? I being your audience, why do I care about the topic that you're writing about? Why do I wanna keep reading this article? Make sure to let your audience know within the first few lines, why do they care about this particular topic? Don't bury your lead, make sure it's right there in the first few lines and in your headline. Pull them in and keep them in. That brings us to number two, who is your audience? Make sure you have a clear idea in mind before you start writing of just who you are writing to. Make sure that it's not something so broad as, oh, all future clients, all potential clients, all of my current clients. Uh, that might be your audience, but let's make sure we have a more focused idea in mind of the person you are writing to so that you're having a conversation with this person through your writing. Finally, keep it simple. Don't, uh, don't overdo it. Try to boil it down to the most important facts that someone's going to need, and then they can call you for the rest. That's not to say you leave part of the story out or have an incomplete article, but you wanna make sure that you are starting the conversation through your writing. And then make sure again that it's an actual conversation. Is this how you would explain it to your friend, to your mother, to your neighbor, to your current client? Keep it simple. Thank you.